بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us yet once again to begin a new series which is going to be encompassing the biographies of the imams of hadith. You know, a lot of work has been done in terms of the imams of fiqh, like on Imam Abu Hanifa, on Imam Malik, Imam al-Shafi, Imam Ahmad, rahimahumullah ajma'een. But very little work has been done in terms of the biography of the imams of hadith. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to start that series up. And inshallah for the next, um, if I'm not mistaken, six to eight weeks, we will be covering the biographies, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So tonight's biography is going to begin with, you know, the main man of hadith himself, Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. And before we get into his life, I want to share a small introduction in terms of my personal infatuation with Imam al-Bukhari. You know, from time to time you get, this, you get asked this question, you know, if you were in Jannah, who's like the one person you'd want to meet? Or if you could go back in history, you know, who's one person you'd want to spend time with and get to know? And for me, like without a shadow of a doubt, if you can't choose, the Prophet said that you can't choose the Sahaba, then for me, it's like without a shadow of a doubt, one of those people on my list is definitely Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. And the story actually started when I was 13 years old. When I was 13 years old, you know, Islamic books, there weren't that many. You had the Noble Quran, you had, what else at that time? The, uh, the, the Guide to the Five Pillars of Islam by Dr. Sarwar. And at that time when I was 13, uh, an, uh, uh, a summarized version of Sahih al-Bukhari had just come out. So my uncle gave that to me as a gift. And for three years, you know, I just stayed on my shelf and I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> you know, what is Sahih al-Bukhari? What are all these statements? And so on and so forth. And as I started getting older, I started studying more, started memorizing Quran. I eventually started learning Arabic. And when I started learning Arabic, I'd have to take the, the bus and the train from my house to get to my Arabic class. Like an hour and 45 minutes every Saturday I'd have to do. So one Saturday I was like, you know what, the, 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 the ride is so boring. I mean, there's no cell phones at that time, there's no iPods, there's no MP3 players, nothing like that at all. You were forced to either interact with people or read a book. And interacting with the people of Montreal, Absolute nightmare. I was like, let me read Sahih al-Bukhari. Let me find out what's going on in this book. And I started re uh, reading the summarized version of Sahih al-Bukhari. And I was amazed, subhanAllah, that the way the book was set up was absolutely amazing. It was like an encyclopedia about everything that you needed to know. Now, as they tell you, you know, a little bit of knowledge is very dangerous. And I started issuing my own fatwas at like 16 years old. <laughs> so people come ask me, they'd see Sayyid Bukhari in my hand, and they're like, oh, you must be a scholar. You know, what's the fatwa on this? No one taught me anything about, you know, being cautious and getting a fatwa or anything like that. So fatwas were going out left, right, and center. So that's like the first introduction. Second introduction, same time, 16 years old, I get taken to one of the worst summer camps of my life. Like it was a disaster and a half. It was so bad that at nighttime there was no lights. Forget electricity, I mean there was no fire even. So one night they served us dinner and they didn't check if the chicken was cooked or not. The chicken was absolutely raw. You only realize it after you took a bite. It wasn't even cooked. I'm not talking about like, it was slightly cooked and undercooked. No one had touched the chicken in terms of cooking it. They served us raw chicken. And you couldn't tell, because it was so heavily induced in spice, you assumed it must have been cooked. That's how bad it was. In this camp, they were, during the daytime, they were selling burgers. The person who was selling the burgers, we used to call him the burger Nazi. You know, for those of you that watched Seinfeld, there was a soup Nazi. This guy was the burger Nazi. If he saw you in line and you weren't, you know, standing straight in line and you didn't say the exact phrase of what you wanted on your burger, he wouldn't serve you a burger. <laughs> and it was absolutely crazy. There was another guy called Mujahid and this guy, I think he was on like some serious, serious drugs. Like not like medicine, but I mean like real drugs. That, <laughs> you know, while we're all in line waiting for the burger, he'd like steal people's burgers and like beat people up. I remember in the middle of the day, he's like body slapping, you know, the teachers. It was crazy. Now, the point of this camp, the point of this camp, one of the speakers that was there was Abu Sama al-Dhahabi. 
and he was giving a lecture on the women that you're not allowed to marry. And in the introduction, he mentioned that, look, there's 19 categories of women that a man is not allowed to marry. Whoever memorizes these names, I will give them $50. As a 16-year-old kid, I was like, 50 free dollars? Let's do this. Now, I didn't have a pen, I didn't have a paper. I, would lit I literally, you know, forced myself to memorize everything. So after the lecture is over, he's like, so has, and as a joke, he's like, so has anyone memorized the 19 categories? And, you know, reluctantly, I raised my hand because I really wanted the money. <laughs> so I raised my hand and he starts smiling. He's like, did you really memorize it? I'm like, inshallah, I think I can do it. So he asked me the 19 categories. I gave him the 19 categories on the spot. And he's like, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have 50 bucks. I didn't think anyone was going to do it. <laughs> but, but what he did do at that time was, he's like, you know what? You look like Imam al-Bukhari. You look like, you know, like you're from Bukhara. So I'm going to start calling you Bukhari. And then for the rest of the camp, that's what people started calling me. And even for like 10 years after that, every time I'd go to Toronto, and that's where the camp was, that's, they would call me Bukhari. And then obviously, you know, give, being given this title, living up to the, that name was a, a huge thing, subhanAllah. And that's where the infatuation really began. Studying his life, studying Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, and so on and so forth. And the very first class I prepared for Al-Maghrib Institute was Sahih al-Bukhari. One of the very first lectures that I gave when I came back from Medina was on the life and lessons from Sahih al-Bukhari. Believe it or not, that was like eight years ago, almost to the day. Almost to the day, eight, eight, eight years ago, subhanAllah. And here we are, eight years later, doing the same thing. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for us. So that having been said, let's start off with his name. His name was Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al mughira ibn Bardizba al-Bukhari al-Ju'fi. Let's go through the name, inshaAllah. Abu Abdullah was his kunya. This is a title that you know, men particularly chose. Either to, you know, to give themselves a, a title or, or, or a laqab, which m other people would refer to them by, they wouldn't refer to themselves as Abu Abdullah. Someone would give them this title, or it was the, the, the name of their oldest son, or if they were, were to have a son, this is what would they would name them. Imam al-Bukhari, it's different as to why he chose Abu Abdullah. And obviously one of the obvious answers was that the Prophet ﷺ said that the two most beloved names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. And he wanted to follow the Sunnah as you will come to see from his life. He loved the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. It's different, did he actually have a son named Abdullah or not? This is a matter of a difference of opinion, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But it seems that he did not actually have a son named Abdullah. He did not have a son named Abdullah and Allah knows best. So Muhammad is his actual real title. This is the name that was given to him by his parents. His father was Ismail ibn Ibrahim. His father was Ismail ibn Ibrahim. Ismail ibn Ibrahim, as we'll come to see, was a very unique individual that inspired Imam al-Bukhari, and we'll get to him in a, in a while. Uh, ibn al-Mughira ibn al-Bardizbah. So al-Mughira was his grandfather that accepted Islam, that accepted Islam. And what happened at that time is that uh, Bukhara, the region, it had a ruler by the name of al-Yaman al-Ju'fi. Al-Yaman al-Ju'fi. And there's a fiqh opinion that when the individual that, you know, gives you your shahada, then you will take their laqab. And that's how Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, his whole family got the name al-Ju'fi at the end of their names. Because the, the ruler's name was al-Yaman al-Ju'fi, and he was the one that gave his family shahada. He was the one that gave his family shahada. So that's where the name al-Ju'fi came from. Al-Bukhari is obviously an, attribu uh, an attribution to the land that he was from, which is Bukhara. Modern day context, Uzbekistan, uh, you know, Turkmenistan, that is the area that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, was from. In terms of the day that he was born, he was born on either the 12th or 13th of Shawwal in the year 194. 12th or 13th of Shawwal, 194, which was the day of Jum'ah, which was the day of Jum'ah. In terms of his birth, there's nothing miraculous that was narrated in terms of what happened to him. But what we do know about his early childhood is two key events. Number one, that his father passed away when he was very, very young. He was very young and his father passed away. And number two, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he actually went blind at the age of three. He actually went blind at the age of three. Now, let us get into his parents and we're going to tie all these points together. His mother, we do not know too much about her. But what we do know about her is that some, she was someone that used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly. She was an abida. Like she loved worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what had happened was when Imam al-Bukhari lost his eyesight at the age of three, 
She had dedicated herself that I'm going to continue praying tahajjud and qiyamul layl every single night and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns his eyesight, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns his eyesight. And it is narrated that she continued this for approximately three years. And this is such a huge lesson. I want you to think about how many things there are in this life that we desire? How many of us are willing to wake up for tahajjud and qiyamul layl each and every single night for three years, right? It's a very difficult and daunting task, right? But she managed to do that, subhanAllah. And it's narrated that at the end of three years, while she was asleep, Ibrahim alayhi salam came to her in his dream, uh, came to her in her dream, and he told her that, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided to return your son's eyesight back. She wakes up in the morning, she goes to her son Muhammad and she notices that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in fact returned his eyesight. And this is like, you know, what we will call the karamat of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we've discussed this before that there's select, you know, slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that reach this level of piety that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them these miraculous events. So you can imagine in this day and age, someone goes blind, you can get the best doctor in the world, take them to the best hospital, give them the best medication possible, and you can't return their eyesight. Once you've lost your eyesight, it's done. But through dua, through tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through begging and pleading with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through you know, shedding those tears for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned to, to uh, Imam al-Bukhari's eyesight to him at that young age. Now you'll notice that this had a huge impact on Imam al-Bukhari, that seeing a mother that is constantly fasting, constantly praying, this was naturally instilled in Imam al-Bukhari. And this is why we can't emphasize enough that parents that want to see righteousness in their children, it begins by you yourself being righteous. It's not enough just to make dua, oh Allah, make them righteous. It's not enough to send them to Islamic school. It's not enough to bring them to the masjid. You have to lead by example. And that's what we see from the life of Imam al-Bukhari. That where did, his, where did he pick up his love of ibadah? It was through his parents. His mother, he saw her constantly worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's move to his father. Let's move to his father. His father, Ismail ibn Ibrahim. Two things that are worthy of mentioning over here. Number one is that Ismail was a scholar of hadith himself. He was a scholar of hadith himself. Imam al-Bukhari, he has a book of history called At-Tariq al-Kabir. And in At-Tariq al-Kabir, he writes the biography of his own father. And subhanAllah, you can imagine what a beloved moment that is to him that he's able to mention the biography of his own father in At-Tariq al-Kabir. At-Tariq al-Kabir, just so that you understand, is not just a book of history, but it's a book of narrators of hadith. And to have your own father mentioned in this, and to be able to write in the Tariq al-Kabir that my father narrated hadith from Imam Malik, and my father narrated hadith from Hamad ibn Zayd, and he accompanied Abdullah ibn Mubarak. You can imagine what a proud moment that was from Imam, for Imam al-Bukhari. But more important than that, where do you think Imam al-Bukhari developed his love for hadith? Right? As young children, young boys, we always want to imitate our fathers. Your father could be you know, a doctor, engineer, dentist. He could be a construction worker. He could be a garbage man, whatever he is. For a young child, he looks up to his father and says, look, I want to be like my dad when I grow up. So he saw this in his father that he studied hadith and he studied with these great, great scholars like Imam Malik and like Abdul Mubarak. This inspired him to become like his father. And that's where the seeds of righteousness, the seeds of studying were actually formed. That he saw his father do this and that is why he followed in his footsteps. Now here's a bigger lesson in righteousness from his father. When his father was passing away, a scholar of hadith came to visit him. And he asked him, you know, what is the legacy that you're leaving behind? What are you leaving behind? And he says, by Allah, the one whom there is no one but he, I have left behind one thing for my family. And that is that I can testify to the fact that there's not a single dinar or dirham that I have earned that was haram or from a dubious source. That was haram or from a dubious source. The narrator of this story, he says, I've never felt jealous of anyone or humbled in front of anyone as I did in front of Ismail ibn Ibrahim that day. That he was so certain that all of his money was halal, I wish I had that level of certainty, right? Now what effect did this have on Imam al-Bukhari? Number one, when Imam al-Bukhari narrated this wealth, obviously it was filled with an immense amount of barakah. That his whole you know, process of studying was funded by the wealth of his father, or at least that was the seed for him you know, studying. That all, all of it was funded from that. Number two, it taught him integrity, that you have to learn, you know, be very cautious of where your money is coming from. It needs to be halal. And then number three, it taught him the importance of, 
You know, being cautious with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having war of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having taqwa, right? That you're cautious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. And you'll come to see this in the personal life of Imam al-Bukhari later on as well. So these were the parents of Imam al-Bukhari. Did Imam al-Bukhari have any siblings? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but he had at least one brother named Ahmad. And what's interesting is that we only know about Ahmad because of one story that Imam al-Bukhari himself mentions. We have no idea anything about his personal life or who he was. So we'll get to Ahmad in a bit. Let's start off with Imam al-Bukhari's young age. At the age of 10, he says, as when he got older, that I was inspired with the love of hadith at the age of 10 or a little bit younger. Or a little bit younger. Like he was in like primary school and he was inspired with the love of hadith. And he started memorizing the books of the scholars of hadith. Al Waqi ibn Jarrah in particular at that time. He started memorizing it around the age of 10. From the age of 10 till the age of 11, literally one year goes by. And he's actually started attending the halaqat of hadith. And a miraculous thing happens in one of the halaqas. He has a teacher by the name of Ad-Dakhili. He has a teacher by the name of Ad-Dakhili. And the, the teacher narrates that Abu Zubair narrated from Ibrahim. And Imam al-Bukhari, right away, he raises his hand and he's like, Abu Zubair never narrated from Ibrahim. They, you know, they, there's no narration from them. Then the teacher, Ad-Dakhili, says, then who narrated it? from Ibrahim. He says it was Zubair ibn Adi. It was Zubair ibn Adi. Imam, he asked Imam al-Bukhari, are you sure? He says, yes. Imam al-Bukhari was so confident, he says, go back and check your notes. Go back and check your notes. 11-year-old kid. You can imagine 11-year-old kid in this halakha right now saying, you're wrong. You got Imam al-Bukhari's name wrong or you got his father's name wrong. We'd be like, who is this young kid? You know, why is he, why is he talking? You know, get him busy with like his Xbox or something. That's how we would treat him, right? But Imam al-Bukhari is correcting his teacher at that age, subhanAllah. The teacher goes back to his manuscript, looks it up. Lo and behold, Imam al-Bukhari was correct. That it was Zubair ibn Adi and not Abu Zubair that narrated the hadith from Ibrahim. So here you start to see the potential that Imam al-Bukhari has. That at the age of 11, he's already correcting his teachers. At the age of 16, he says, my mother wanted to go for Hajj, so my brother Ahmad and I decided to take her for Hajj. They take her for Hajj, and when they reach al Haramain, they reach Mecca and Medina, something just settles in Imam al-Bukhari. Something tells him, look, I need to stay here, and he need to start studying Hadith. I need to start studying with the scholars of this land. And this teaches us that, you know, he had spent a fair amount of time studying with the scholars in his own land, and when he had maximized that potential, that is when he started studying with the scholars outside of his own land. And this is a very valuable lesson for those of us that want to become students of knowledge. That before you can go and study outside, you need to study in your own locality. Sometimes it means studying with your local imam. Sometimes it means studying with your local Arabic teacher. Benefit from people in any way that you can. And this is what we need to inspire people with. That before you can become a student of knowledge by traveling overseas, you need to become a student of knowledge in your own hometown. If you can't hack it out over here, trust me, you're not going to be able to hack it out anywhere overseas when you go studying. Whether it be Egypt, whether it be Mecca, Medina, Riyadh, Malaysia, wherever it may be, you're not going to be able to become a student of knowledge until you develop those etiquettes and those mannerisms where you are currently living like Imam al-Bukhari did. So at the age of 16, he leaves for Hajj with his brother Ahmad. His mother and his brother Ahmad return back home. Imam al-Bukhari decides, you know what, I'm going to stay in Medina and I'm going to benefit from the scholars of hadith at that time. Two years go by, he starts studying. And what happens at the age of 18? He authors his first book at the age of 18, subhanAllah. It was called Qadaya Sahaba wa Tabi'een, meaning the, 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 the legal rulings and verdicts of the companions of the Prophet wasallam and the successors. Now obviously this teaches us a lot. Number one, his intelligence. Number two, his diligence in terms of learning so much that at the age of 18, you know, he was able to write a book. I want you to think about what were you doing at the age of 18? What were you doing at that time? You know, I particularly think I was just finishing college at that time, obsessed with video games, obsessed with hanging out with my friends. You know, that's what was on my mind at that time. And here we have Imam Bukhari finished authoring his first book, finished authoring his first book. We also learn from Imam al-Bukhari's uh, methodology over here that he teaches us that you know, true Islam is based upon what the Prophet ﷺ was revealed 
upon the understanding of the Sahaba and those that followed them in righteousness. So he tried to compile all of the verdicts and rulings of those people that met the Messenger of Allah and learned from the Messenger of Allah and those people that learned from those people, the Tabi'een. And this teaches us about methodology that you always need to go back to the earliest sources. And this is what Imam al-Bukhari shows us for at that young age of 18. Eventually, a few years later, he is inspired to write Sahih al-Bukhari, but we'll get to that in its proper time. And he spent 16 years compiling Sahih al-Bukhari. But let us take a look briefly at Imam al-Bukhari's personal life. Let us take a look at Imam al-Bukhari's personal life. Was Imam al-Bukhari married? Did he have children? As you mentioned earlier, Allah knows best, difference of opinion on this issue. But it doesn't seem that Imam al-Bukhari got married or had any children. It doesn't appear that Imam al-Bukhari got married or had any children. What was his favorite pastime? His favorite pastime without a shadow of a doubt after hadith and seeking knowledge was archery. He loved archery. And he had a companion with him who is his warraq. Warraq meaning like his scribe. His name was Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim. Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim. And a lot of the narrations about the life of Imam al-Bukhari come from this man Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim. He says, I accompanied Imam al-Bukhari for a prolonged period of time. And in fact, if you look at the period of time, it's almost like 14 years that he accompanied Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. And he says, I saw him practice archery regularly and I never saw him miss his target except twice. I never saw him miss his target except twice. And that is how proficient Imam al-Bukhari was in archery. Now what is the, the fundamental purpose behind archery? Like we hear a lot about archery in Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa it's a marfu' and mawquf, the narration that teach your children archery and swimming and horseback riding, right? These are the three things the Prophet Sallam in one of the narrations which is marfu' he says, teach your children these three things. What is the wisdom behind archery? From archery you learn that practice makes perfect. The first time you shoot an arrow, you will get hurt. You will really, really get hurt. For those of you that have tried it, it will end up hitting your forearm and it will sting like crazy. But you keep practicing and you eventually get better at it. And it teaches you that anything in life there's natural talent, but a lot of it will come by practice. And that's what, you know, teaches, well, that's what benefits him in knowledge as well. Studying hadith is perhaps the most meticulous and difficult sciences in Islam. And through practice, you'll get better at it. Number two, it teaches us the importance of focus. That in archery, your eye always needs to be on the target. You cannot focus on, you can't be looking over here and try to hit something. You'll end up killing someone or the person you weren't supposed to hit, right? It teaches us the importance of focus. That do one thing at a time, right? And that's the importance of focus. And now if you look, you know, look at business leadership books, they always talk about the importance of focus. Do one task and do it well. That's what archery, te archery teaches you because you can only do one thing at a time. It teaches us the importance of having a goal. That you can't just live life aimlessly. You have to have targets. You have to have goals. That is how you progress. That is how you get better. And all of these things helped Imam al-Bukhari become the great scholar of hadith that he was. They all helped him become the great scholar of hadith that he was. In terms of his personal life, how many people suffer from insomnia? Anyone have difficulty sleeping? I'm like from one of those people. Like I'll sleep like two, three hours, then I'll wake up and I'll be up for like two, three hours, and I'll sleep again for another two, three hours. And this happens to me a lot, subhanAllah. And I take solace in the fact that perhaps, you know, it's like inspired from Imam al Bukhari. It's just really my bad sleeping habits a lot of the times. But Imam al Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, he says Imam al Bukhari used to wake up between 15 to 20 times a night. 15 to 20 times. He says Imam al Bukhari. I'd be laying next to him, he would get up, he would kindle his light, write down a fayd of hadith, and go back to sleep. Sometime later, he'd wake up, kindle the fire, write a fayd of hadith, and go back to sleep. And he said this would happen on average 15 to 20 times a night. So that was his personal life. You can see it was like, you know, quite disturbed, subhanAllah. He wouldn't sleep regularly. He wouldn't sleep regularly. Number three, in his personal life, his love for the Qur'an. And subhanAllah, when you read his love for the Qur'an, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he teaches us that you're, you're not allowed to have halal jealousy, which is called ghibta, except for two people. The individual that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave wealth to, and he spends it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the individual that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave knowledge to, and a love for the Qur'an, and he teaches it to the people, and he implements it himself, right? We see from Imam al-Bukhari's life, that Imam al-Bukhari would read a third of the Qur'an every single, uh, every single night. Every single night, this was his habit. He would finish the Qur'an every three days in night, in, night, in Qiyamul Layl, in Qiyamul Layl. During the daytime, 
He would try to finish the whole Quran once. He would try to finish the whole Quran once. Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, he asked him, you know, what is your motivation behind this? Like, how do you reach that level? He says, and then he narrates the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam narrated that with every khatma of the Quran is a dua mustajab, is a dua which is answered. And I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer my duas. And this shows us the effort that he used to put in in getting his duas answered. Now you could tie this back into his mother. Remember his dua, his mother was making dua for three years, every single night, qiyamul layl, tears coming out of her eyes. This is the impact it had on Imam al-Bukhari. You want your duas to be answered, you need to work for it. You can't just be fake and shallow and, oh Allah, guide me and, oh Allah, grant me this. Right, without any effort, without trying to be righteous. Imam al-Bukhari is showing us that make an effort, read the Qur'an. When you finish reading the Qur'an, make du'a and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers your du'as. And anyone that's memorized the Qur'an or reads the Qur'an regularly can testify to this. That the du'a that you make once you complete the Qur'an is not like the du'a that you'll make after salah or even in your sajda. You could feel like right away, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to the people of the Qur'an. So he's finishing the Qur'an at night, every three days, and during the day, he's trying to finish at least once every day. The honor of Imam al-Bukhari, his integrity. You know, what was the thing that was most beloved in terms of characteristics? It was his own integrity. And there's a story that is narrated about him that one day he was on a ship and he had with him 10,000 dirhams, 10,000 dirhams. This is the equivalent of like $100,000, subhanAllah. Right, he's carrying that much money with him. As he gets onto the boat, an individual notices that Imam al-Bukhari has this money. So this individual, he decides, you know what? I will get this money off of Imam al-Bukhari. That was his goal. This whole trip, he's focused on getting this money from Imam al-Bukhari. Now, he's not going to steal the money from Imam al-Bukhari because Imam al-Bukhari is keeping a very good eye on it, right? What does he decide to do? In the middle of the night, while everyone is asleep, he starts shouting out, I've been robbed, I've been robbed. Okay, what have you lost? I lost 10,000 dirhams. Let us go and find who has 10,000 dirhams. Okay? They start a manhunt. They get to Imam al-Bukhari's room, and this man is sure, he's like, this is the man, he's the one that took my money. They search his room upside down. The money is nowhere to be found. This man is perplexed, he's so upset, he's like, I was supposed to have that money, where did you hide it? Obviously he couldn't say that because then he would, he, people would realize he was guilty. They arrive at their destination and this man goes up to Imam al-Bukhari and he asks him, where is the 10,000 dirhams that I know you had for a fact? Imam al-Bukhari responds to him by saying, I threw it over the boat, I threw it over the boat. And he says, are you crazy? Why would you throw 10,000 dirhams off of the boat? You know, it's 10,000 dirhams. And he says, my ambition in life is to teach people hadith. And if my reputation was to become even tarnished a little bit, this would become a hindrance in them accepting my statements and narrations from the Prophet ﷺ. So more beloved to me than this money is my integrity. And if you really want that money, then go sink at the bottom of the sea, you'll find it over there. And Imam al-Bukhari subhanAllah sacrificed the money for the sake of integrity. Now I want you to think about, you know, what would you possibly do in this situation? A lot of us would be like, let's just hold on the money for dear life. Maybe hide it somewhere on the ship that it can't be found. Or maybe even argue our case, you know, this guy's lying. And you know, you get into a dispute with him. But Imam al-Bukhari is like, you know what, put my trust in Allah. Allah gives money, he takes money, inshallah he'll replace it with something better. And this is something you'll notice about Imam al-Bukhari, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with money time and time again. That Allah would give him money, he would spend it on his students, he would spend it on his teachers, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him more. And you wouldn't know where this was coming from subhanAllah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued to give him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued to give him. Now let's talk about the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. The teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. Ibn Hajjah rahimahullah, who is perhaps the most prolific commentator on the work of Imam al-Bukhari. Like Imam al-Bukhari's most famous work was Sahih al-Bukhari. And the most famous commentary on this book is called Fath al-Bari. Fath al-Bari by Ibn Hajar al-Askarani. Now even though many Fath al-Baris have been written, like Ibn Rajab, he also wrote a Fath al-Bari. Other scholars also wrote a Fath al-Bari. But the one that remained is the Fath al-Bari of Ibn Hajar. That became the most famous. And in his uh, introduction to Fath al-Bari, it's called Hadi al-Sari, which is a two-volume introduction. He talks about many, many interesting aspects of Sahih al-Bukhari and Imam al-Bukhari's methodology and his teachers and his students, etc. One of the things we benefit is how he devised 
this teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. He divides the teachers into, of Imam al-Bukhari into five different categories. But before we get into these categories, we want to look at two particular things in terms of teachers. Number one is that we want to look at the number of teachers that Imam al-Bukhari has. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he says, I met 1,080 different teachers. So this is like the absolute minimum that he met. Is 1,080 different teachers and they all said that Iman increases and decreases and that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. So the point is, I mean, that's the Aqidah benefit at the end, that Iman increases and decreases and that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah and not created. But at the beginning, it shows us how many teachers he actually studied and benefited from. 1,080 at the very least. And in fact, it's much, much more than that as well. It's much, much more than that as well. The second thing we learn about Imam al-Bukhari is why would Imam al-Bukhari actually do this? And he was learnt, remember, who can remind me, what was one of the first books that Imam al-Bukhari read? Whose book did Imam al-Bukhari read from a very young age? Who remembers? Waqiya okay. what? Waqiya ibn Jarrah, who said that? <laughs> Jazakallah khair, ahsanallahu ilayk. Waqiya ibn Jarrah from a very young age. So there's a statement by Waqiya ibn Jarrah, he says that you will never be a true scholar until you benefited from three people. Those that are older than you, those that are your peers and contemporaries, and those that are younger than you, those that are younger than you. Imam al-Bukhari took this statement as a motivation and he actually altered it. And rather than using the term scholar being, you know, complete or not, you will not become a scholar until you do these three, Imam al-Bukhari changed it into, a you will never become a muhaddith that is complete, that is completely well-rounded until you've done three things. Learn from those older than you, learn from your contemporaries, and learn from those younger than you. And we see this clearly in the five categories that Ibn Hajar rahimahullah puts as the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. So category number one, those are the teachers that narrated from the tabi'een directly. They narrated from the second generation of Islam, the second generation of Islam. The second category are those that lived during their time, but didn't narrate from the tabi'een. Those that lived during their time, but didn't narrate from the tabi'een. Number three, the third category, is those that narrated from the kibar of atba' at tabi'in. So you have the, the sahaba, you have the tabi'in, and then you have the atba' at tabi'in. So category number three is that those that narrated from the kibar of the atba' at tabi'in. Category number four are those who are his contemporaries. Category number four are those who are considered his contemporaries. And category number five, those are less than him in age, less than him in isnad, and less than him in knowledge, right? Category number five was those that are less than him. Now I want you to go back to the statement by Imam al-Bukhari and by al ibn al-Jarrah. Learning from those that are older than you, learning from your contemporaries, and learning from those that are younger than you. Who can derive benefits from the first one? Why should we learn from those that are older than you? Who can tell me why? Go ahead. Ahsan, fantastic. So when it comes to learning from those that are older than us, people who are older than us have more experience than us, have more wisdom than us, and they've lived a longer life than we have. And this is something we need to realize. In life, Allah has given us a limited amount of time, right? We each have, Allah knows best, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, right? That's one life. Now imagine if you develop a, a motto, a philosophy for yourself, that you will learn and benefit from everyone that you meet, you're adding that extra lifespan that they've had into your own life as well. So it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is increasing the barakah in your life and your own life expectancy when you develop this philosophy of learning from everyone. So you learn from the elders, that of experience, that from wisdom. And you also learn from them that of ibadah, that when we look at our elders, we should assume the best of them, that Allah has given them long lives in which they've you know, preceded us in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which they've preceded us in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What can we benefit from? Learning from those who are contemporaries. Who can you tell me? What can we learn from learning from our contemporaries? Why should we learn from our contemporaries? Go ahead. Mistake. Mistakes. So if there's a mistake that we made, then our contemporaries can help correct us. Fantastic. Go ahead. Interact for uh, diversity, like to know what's the other opinions. Fantastic. So you learn perspective, you learn different opinions on a similar matter. When you look at one thing, you will see it one way. Your contemporaries will look at it another way. Can we look, uh, think of something else? What else can we think of? Why else should we learn from our contemporaries? Go ahead. You compare yourself to others and see how, how, how you're doing, 
Fantastic, fantastic. You compare yourself to others. That those that are better than you, you try to aspire to be just as good as them, right? Like Abu Bakr and Umar. Umar knew that Abu Bakr was better than him. He aspired to be like Abu Bakr, right? Similarly with the contemporaries, those that are better than you, you learn to aspire to be better. And then those that are making mistakes, you know, you learn from their mistakes as well. You learn that these are the mistakes that I shouldn't be doing. So that is why we learn from our contemporaries. Also, you learn from your contemporaries, the importance of learning from your contemporaries is humility and removal, removal of jealousy. Like Sheikh Abdul Thaymin rahimahullah, he comments in Kitab al-Ilm that jealousy is not as prevalent in any group of people as it is amongst the scholars. Students of knowledge and scholars have the utmost amount of jealousy. Shaitan plays with their hearts so badly. And that's like one of the diseases of our times that we find one scholar speaking bad about another scholar and then the people get involved and it's one huge fiasco. But if people took the time to learn from one another and humble themselves in front of one another for the sake of Allah and for the sake of knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would remove that jealousy from their hearts. Allah would remove that jealousy from their hearts. Now let's move on to the youngest category. Why should we learn from those that are younger than us? Muhammad, I'm looking at you, man. Give me a reason why we should learn from those that are younger than us. Technology. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. So you can learn from perspective. So there's uh, that concept of, you know, a generation gap. People will uh, cherish things and, and see things differently than you do. So you learn perspective. Amar. I think you might be thinking a little bit too young. <laughs> but that's the teacher in you. You're thinking about your students, mashallah, right? So he's mentioning innocence. I don't know how, how much that applies. But let's try to interpret his statement in the best way. That our predecessors used to say that you learn from the young that Allah has blessed them more than you because they've committed less sins than you. Due to their lesser amount of time they've been alive, they've committed less sins than you. So it, it teaches you that humility that, you know what, we should be aspired to commit less sin like those younger than us have done. Can we get one more as to why we should learn from those that are younger than us? Our brother in the back. Because um, as a new generation comes, there's a little bit of compromise. Fantastic. So it's, it, it, it's you know, mutual cooperation in knowledge. That knowledge is what's tying these two people together. And just like you were inspired by those older than you, when you learn from those that are younger than you, you can correct their mistakes, you can continue to inspire them and guide them along the path. And this is the importance of mentorship in Islam. That right, we each have a responsibility towards one another that when one of us is down, we lift them up. And when someone is up, we can inspire them and encourage them to become even better, right? And that is what mentoring, mentoring actually does. So the older, the seniors should look after the youngers. We'll add to this is that when an individual is younger, he has more enthusiasm to worship Allah, that can be learned from the young. Usually their memories are better, so you can be inspired to work harder in your memory, right? So those are some of the things that we benefit from learning that the scholar, from the scholars that are younger than you. Learning from the scholars that are younger than you. Now we get to the memory of Imam al-Bukhari. We get to the memory of Imam al-Bukhari. You know, in our day and age, if someone has memorized the Qur'an, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, that's like the epitome of, you know, or pinnacle of that one's memory will, will reach. You memorize the Qur'an, you know, you're like in the top 1% of the Muslim Ummah already. You memorize the, the Ashara Kira'at, and then you add to it like the four Shada as well, you're like from the 0.0001% of this Ummah. And that's just with the Qur'an. Now Imam al-Bukhari, not only had he memorized the Qur'an, he narrates about himself, I've memorized 300,000 hadith. 100,000 of them sahih, 200,000 of them da'if, weak. Obviously, we can understand why 100,000 authentic ones, because you want to make amal upon the authentic ones. Why is he memorizing the 200,000 weak ones? Two reasons. Number one is so that you can differentiate between true and false. You will never know what is true until you know what is false, right? Like we know what is sahih because we're able to categorize what is da'if. So in order to differentiate between the two, you need to know the difference between the two. Number two, is that why we learn the da'if hadith as well? Is because over time, if we will not, you know, document what is authentic and what is not authentic, people will naturally assume what is not authentic to be authentic and pass it on. So it's, you know, a part of preservation of the hadith as well. It's part of preservation of the hadith as well. So that's why he's doing it. And obviously, you know, when you see people doing amal, you can sort of understand why they may be doing this amal. Perhaps they're doing it on a weak hadith, right? And this is like a huge ikhtilaf in usul al-fiqh. Can you actually implement weak hadith or not? But that we'll save for another time, right? 
We also learn from this, from Imam al-Bukhari's, you know, memory. Is that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he would be able to hear something once and memorize it. He would be able to look at something once and memorize it. In fact, when he is reading a book, he would have to cover one page and just read one page because he was afraid that if he read, you know, the book was open both pages at the same time, it would overlap in his mind. So he'd only read one page just once and it would be engraved in his mind. And that is how amazing his memory was, subhanAllah. We also learn from the biography of Imam al-Bukhari about his memory. The not only ability to memorize, but the ability to analyze, process, and scrutinize. So once you become renowned for your memory, what do people always want to do? They want to test you. They're like, today I will prove you wrong. I will prove you are a fraud. Right? That's what people want to do when they see you have a talent, subhanAllah. So Imam al-Bukhari enters into Iraq in his gathering of hadith. Ten people come and they're like, we have, you know, these are hadith that we're going to narrate to you. Please correct them for us. Please correct them for us. So they each took a uh, hundred hadith, ten of them, and they it changed up the isnad, the narrators of the hadith, completely destroyed, upside down, changing up names, did everything. And then they changed up the matan as well. They put the wrong isnad with the wrong matan as well. And they started narrating these hadith to Imam al-Bukhari. One hundred, ten people at a time. Once they're all done, Imam al-Bukhari says, are you done? They say yes. And everyone's like, today we made him a fool. You know, Imam al-Bukhari, we, we've humiliated him. He doesn't know what to say. Imam al-Bukhari repeated to them all of their incorrect versions of their hadith. And then he told them the correct version of the hadith. <laughs> That's like the biggest slap in the face. <laughs> he taught you your error, showed you your error. And then he shows you the correct version as well. And this is the memory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, had blessed Imam al-Bukhari with. A lot of people, you know, when you think about, you know, such a memory, they're like, look, these stories need to be fabricated. They can't be authentic. How is it possible that someone's memory is that good? What we fail to realize is that these people came from a completely different generation. There was no technology. These people had piety and taqwa. Their minds were pure. Their hearts were innocent. And they dedicated their lives to knowledge. They lived for nothing else, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, during that time, had blessed so many people's memories. You know, similar statements are said about Imam al-Shafi. Similar statements are said about you know, Imam al-Hakim. All these great scholars, they all had similar stories. They were blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even in, like, in modern day times, I can't remember his, uh, his name, but the man that they made Rain, Rain Man off of, what was his name? Kim Pikes or Kern Pikes or something? Anyone remember? Yeah, I think you're too, a bit too young to remember Rain Man. <laughs> But anyways, there's a movie that was made after him. And he, same thing with this man. He would see something and it was like engraved in his mind. He could like never forget it. Like true photographic memory, subhanAllah. And even in our current day times, you'll find it from time to time. I want to share with you three praises of Imam al-Bukhari. Three praises of Imam al-Bukhari. The first one is by Qutayba ibn Sa'id. I want you to understand this, know this name, Qutayba ibn Sa'id. Why is Qutayba ibn Sa'id, his name so significant? There are very, very few people who all six Imams of Hadith had as a teacher, meaning that they were all united under one teacher. One of those individuals was Qutayba ibn Sa'id, that Imam al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam al-Tirmidhi, Imam Abu Dawud, Imam al-Nasai, Imam ibn Majah, all of them narrated directly from Qutayba ibn Sa'id. Now you will see context of why it's important to know his name and how he dealt with the other great Imams of Hadith when he makes this statement. He says, وَقَالَ كُتَيْبُ بْنُ سَعِيدٍ جَالَسْتُ وَالْفُقَهَاءِ وَالزُّحَادِ وَالْعُبَّادِ فَمَا رَأَيْتُ مُنذُ أُكِلْتُ مِثْلَ مُحَمَّدِ بْنُ إِسْمَعِيلِ وَهُوَ فِي زَمَانِهِ كَعُمْرَ فِي الصَّحَابَةِ وَقَالَ أَيْدًا لَوْ كَانَ مُحَمَّدِ بْنِ إِسْمَعِيلِ فِي الصَّحَابَةِ لَكَانَ آيَةٍ I want you to understand the statement, subhanAllah. Qutayb ibn Sa'id, he says, I've sat with the people of fiqh, I've sat with the ascetics, I've sat with the worshippers, and I have never seen anyone since I was able to distinguish the likes of Imam al-Bukhari. He was in his time the likes of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu in his time. He also said, if Muhammad ibn Ismail was from the Sahaba, he would have been a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst the Sahaba. Such a heavy statement, subhanAllah. And he, this is the same teacher that taught Imam Muslim, that taught at Tirmidhi, that taught at Nasai, Abu Dawood, and Ibn Majah, and many other great scholars of hadith. And this is the type of praise that he has for Imam al-Bukhari. He has for Imam al-Bukhari. We have another statement over here. وَقَالَ أَحْمَدُ بْنُ حَنْبَلْ 
ما ما أخرجت خراسان مثل محمد بن إسماعيل. That the whole province of Khorasan and many many great scholars came from Khorasan. Khorasan has never produced the likes of Muhammad ibn Ismail. And I'll share one last one with you. And this one is really, you know, mind-boggling, subhanAllah. It gives you perception on the life of Imam al-Bukhari. So there are certain scholars that were like giants. But we don't know too much about them because they were very, very specialized in their science, right? So we know the general scholars of fiqh, we know some of the scholars of hadith. But there are certain scholars of hadith that literally we don't know too much about. One of those individuals is Ali ibn al-Madini. Ali ibn al-Madini. Great, great scholar of hadith. SubhanAllah, you know, one of the greatest scholars of hadith that ever lived. His specialization was in ilal al-hadith. Hidden defects inside of hadith. That is what his specialization was in. Okay, so Imam al-Bukhari, he says, وَقَالَ الْبُخَارِ مَا أَسْتَغَرْتُ نَفْسِي عِنْدَ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا عِنْدَ عَلِيَ بْنُ الْمَدِينِ وَرُبَّمَا كُنْتُ أَغْرَبْ عَلَيْهِ That Imam al-Bukhari, he says, I never belittled myself in front of anyone like I did in front of Ali ibn al-Madini. Right, this is what he says about Ali ibn al-Madini because of his, you know, great reputation, his great knowledge uh, of hadith. Now this is narrated to Ali ibn al-Madini. قَالَ حَامِدْ ibn أَحْمَدْ فَذُكِرَ هَذَا الْكَلَامِ لِعَلِي ibn al-Madini فَقَالَ لِي دَعْ قَوْلَهُ هُوَ مَا رَأَى مِثْلَ نَفْسِهِ That Imam al uh, Ali ibn al-Madini, he says, you know, forget what Imam al-Bukhari said. Imam al-Bukhari hasn't seen the likes of himself. Imam al-Bukhari hasn't seen the likes of himself. So here we see that Imam al-Bukhari recognized the greatness of another scholar and that other great scholar, he has no problem saying that, look, forget about me. Imam al-Bukhari has never seen the likes of himself and never will we see the likes of Imam al-Bukhari again. So the praise of the scholars for Imam al-Bukhari is, you know, it's too much. It's like, I mean, I, 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 it's a myriad. You know, that's all you can say is myriad. There's just too much praise. Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he says that if we were to open up the door, for the praises of Imam al-Bukhari, this is an ocean that knows no shore. Meaning an ocean that has no boundaries. That, you know, the scholars have praised Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah that much. So I just want to share some of the insights um, in terms of praise for Imam al-Bukhari uh, that the scholars had for Imam al-Bukhari. I really want to finish by, by 9.30, but I don't think that's going to happen. So we might have to delay Isha for like 5 or 10 minutes inshallah. So please forgive me in advance. Now, let us get into his books. Let us get into his books. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he has four books that we want to discuss. The first book we already spoke about, Qadaya al-Sahaba wa Tabi'in. The very first book that he authored, it was about the opinions of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in pertaining to fiqh rulings, okay? Book number two that we want to speak about is At-Tariq. And At-Tariq had three you know, sections to it, or three categories to it. At-Tariq al-Saghir, At-Tariq al-Awsat, and At-Tariq al-Kabir. And this was you know, a book that was dedicated to the narrators of hadith. Inside of this book, you'll find every famous narrator of hadith before Imam al-Bukhari. Two things we want to mention about this. Imam al-Bukhari, he says that you can ask me about any narrator of hadith and I will have something to tell you about them. And I summarized this, I summarized a tariq from my memory. If you were to put tariq al saghir al awsat and al kabir together, and he's calling this like a summarized version, we're talking like 37 volumes. This is a summarized version. You can imagine what the complete version is like, right? And this is all from his memory, subhanAllah. And in the tariq al kabir, we mentioned that he mentioned the story of his father as well. The third book we want to know about from Imam al Bukhari is Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, is Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. And Alhamdulillah in our times, you know, this is a book that mashallah is being recognized for its virtue and for its merit. This was Imam Al-Bukhari's, you know, dedication to good manners and morals and manners. So he, he, he compiled Al-Adab Al-Mufrad to talk about Adab, to talk about good character. And there's some interesting and unique hadith in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad that you won't find in other collections. Like the hadith, uh, of uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted Nuh alayhi salam to know that the flood was now over, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him a rainbow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him a rainbow. And this is the only hadith out of all of the collections of hadith that you'll find the term rainbow mentioned in, right? And Imam al-Bukhari brings this in al-Adab al-Mufrad. In al-Adab al-Mufrad, Imam al-Bukhari, he has a chapter. ماذا يقول الرجل إذا زكية? What should an individual say when he is praised? And he teaches us the dua that Imam uh, al-Albani rahimahullah became famous for. That when he was praised, this is the dua that he would always say. اللهم لا تؤخذني بما يقولون وجعلني خير مما يظنون واغفر لي لما لا يعلمون. That oh Allah, do not hold 
me accountable for what they say about me. Make me better than what they think of me and forgive me for what they don't know about me. And he brings this in Al-Adab al-Mufrad, saying that the Sahaba used to say this when they were praised. So these are some of the unique things that we find in Al-Adab al-Mufrad. Alhamdulillah, there's a wonderful, wonderful translation that was just completed last year. It was published out of Malaysia by um, the Dawah Corner. And what they did was they took the, uh, the, the checkings of Sheikh Al-Bani and took some commentary from other scholars and put it together in one fat volume. So if you're able to get that, I would definitely recommend getting that. The last book we want to speak about from Imam al-Bukhari is none other than al-Jami' al-Sahih, meaning the book known as Sahih al-Bukhari. Let us talk about what was the inspiration behind a Sahih al-Bukhari. Two things happened that inspired Imam al-Bukhari to write Sahih al-Bukhari. Number one, he has a teacher by the name of Ishaq ibn Rahawi. Ishaq ibn Rahawi. This teacher is, subhanAllah, I don't even know what the word for it is. But he was like a, of a caliber, of a stature that is equal to, if not greater than, the four famous imams of fiqh and the scholars of hadith. That this man was a mujtahid in fiqh, a, you know, amir al mu'minin fil hadith, you know, a, 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 an ayah in kira'at, in everything. Like this man was absolutely amazing. And this man, subhanAllah, he died young and he didn't, you know, his, his students didn't write down too much from him. His madhab got completely lost. But if you look at some of his fiqh, it's absolutely amazing, subhanAllah. So one day, Ishaq ibn Rahawai, in his halaqa, he just randomly throws it out there. You know, I wish someone would gather the authentic hadith. Just a thought like that. I wish someone would gather the authentic hadith. At that time, something settled in Imam al-Bukhari's heart. I will be that individual that will gather the authentic hadith, subhanAllah. And just like a whisper from his teacher became his lifelong work, subhanAllah. Became his lifelong work. The second inspiration behind Sahih al-Bukhari is that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he had a dream in which he saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he saw that flies were coming to attack the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he took a fan and started waving the flies away. You know, started fanning the flies away. And when Imam al-Bukhari he saw this hadith, he couldn't understand what it meant. He told this to his teacher, Ishaq ibn Rahawi, and Ishaq ibn Rahawi he tells him that inshallah this is a sign that you will defend the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is a sign that you will defend the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he took it upon himself to dedicate 16 years of his life to writing Sahih al-Bukhari. Most of it was written in Al-Madina in uh, Riyadh al-Jannah, you know, the, the Garden of Paradise in the Masjid al-Nabawi. That, that's where most of it was written. Now, what's unique about Sahih al-Bukhari? If you look at the numbering of Sahih al-Bukhari, Scholars have differed, what are the actual number of a hadith? 7,300, 7,600. And in fact, if you include the mu'allaqat and the statements of the Sahaba and you know, other narrations of the Tabi'een, it goes all the way to 9,000. Imam al-Bukhari, he says, I did not include a single hadith inside Sahih al-Bukhari, except that I prayed two rak'ahs of istikhara to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except that I prayed two rak'ahs of istikhara to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Completely, you know, rounding the figure off. Let us just say he put 7,700 a hadith, which is the most common number that Ibn Hajjad mentions. 7,700 a hadith in there. How many rakahs has Imam al Bukhari prayed just for istikhara? Who can tell me? 15,400. That's just istikhara. Putting his qiyamul layl aside, putting his sunnah prayers aside, this is just istikhara. Should I include this hadith inside Sahih al Bukhari or not? Where is Imam al Bukhari getting this dedication from? Bring it back to the mother. He saw the mother worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it continued on to Imam al-Bukhari. And this is what we learn that, you know, piety it transcends the, 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 the genealogy that parents are righteous. Inshallah, the children will be righteous as well. So this is what Imam al-Bukhari did. What was the goal behind Imam al-Bukhari's sahih? It was to gather, again, a summarized version of the authentic hadith on the most important chapters that he felt. On the most important chapters that he felt. And that's why when you read Sahih al-Bukhari, what Imam al-Bukhari did was he wrote the chapter headings first, and then he looked for the hadith that were authentic to put underneath. 
Then you look for the hadith to put underneath. That is why you open up Sahih al-Bukhari, sometimes all you find is a chapter heading, and you're like, what happened to the hadith? You know, who stole the hadith? Who forgot the hadith? There's no hadith forgotten. In fact, the chapter headings are the fiqh of Imam al-Bukhari. The chapter headings are the fiqh of Imam al-Bukhari, that he put those chapter headings before including the hadith, that he knew what he was looking for. Remember the target practice in archery? He knew what he was looking for, and then he went searching for the best hadith that he could possibly find. In terms of specific hadith inside Sahih al-Bukhari. The shortest hadith inside Sahih al-Bukhari, it has three people between Imam al-Bukhari and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Three people between Imam al-Bukhari and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The longest hadith in Sahih, Sahih al-Bukhari in terms of Isnad has 11 people. So the shortest is three, the longest is 11, and the vast majority are somewhere in between. The vast majority are somewhere in between. I want to briefly give you insight into how Imam al-Bukhari chose his hadith and why. Who can tell me what's the first hadith inside Sahih al-Bukhari? Innam al-A'malu bin niyat Fantastic. Let's make the question a bit more difficult. What is the first chapter inside Sahih al-Bukhari? <coughs> Intention? No. Kitab al-Ilm. But what is the chapter? Al-Wahi. Fantastic. Al-Wahi. That is the, 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 the first chapter. It is Al-Wahi. Now, the chapter heading is Kitab al-Wahi. And the first hadith is Innam al-A'malu bin niyat What is the relationship between this hadith and in the, uh, and, uh, and the, the chapter heading of Revelation. A very simplistic answer that someone will give you is, Imam al-Bukhari, he wants to remind himself and the reader to purify their intention before they embark upon this journey. This answer is 99.9% .9 true. That the person that does not have knowledge of hadith, this is what he will assume to be true, that Imam al-Bukhari is just merely giving us a reminder to remind himself and to remind the reader, purify your intention before you read this book. But now when you look at the isnad that Imam al-Bukhari chose, you'll notice that Imam al-Bukhari had a much, much bigger intention behind choosing this particular version of the hadith. So let us go through the chain of narration. Who narrated the hadith? Who knows? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. Where was Umar ibn al-Khattab from? He was from Mecca. Who narrated this hadith from Umar ibn al-Khattab? Only one individual, al qama ibn al-Waqqas, who was also from Mecca. Who narrated this hadith from al qama ibn Waqqas? Muhammad ibn Ibrahim at taymi Muhammad ibn Ibrahim at taymi who was also from Mecca. Who narrated this hadith from Muhammad ibn Ibrahim at taymi Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari. Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari, who was from, Ansari gives it away, from Medina. Who narrated, who, who narrated this hadith from Medina? From Medina? It was Sufyan bin Uyayna. Sufyan bin Uyayna narrated this from Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari. Who narrated this hadith from Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari? It was uh, Al-Humaydi, whose name was Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was also Qurashi, who was also from Mecca, and he was Qurashi as well. Where does Imam al-Bukhari get this hadith from now? It is from Al-Humaydi, who was Abdullah ibn Zubair. Right, so this is the chain of narration. What are we finding in this chain of narration? All the narrators are from the lands of Revelation, they're from the lands of Al-Wahi, either from Mecca or, or Medina. Sufyan ibn Uyayna was from both Mecca and Medina. And we look particularly at, you know, Abdullah ibn Zubair, who is Al-Humaydi. He was from the Quraysh. The Prophet sallallahu said, give Quraysh preference, you know, qaddimu al-Quraysh. So the very first hadith that Imam al-Bukhari narrates, not only does he bring the narrators from the lands of revelation, but he implements that hadith of Qaddim al-Quraysh by the very first hadith being Innam al-A'malu bin Niyat. He gives the, the isnad of uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair al-Humaydi who is also Qurashi by giving preference to the Quraysh. And then on top of that, after all of that, it serves as a reminder, purify your intention before you study this book. And that is the genius behind this book, subhanAllah. That every single hadith that Imam al-Bukhari book put on the surface level, it seems like you understand why Imam al-Bukhari is doing it. But Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he does a fantastic job of extrapolating those lessons that the average reader won't see. And this is like what we call the Taif al-Isnad, you know, the, the beautiful lessons from the Isnad of the Hadith and the different versions of the Hadith. So that is Sahih al-Bukhari. That is Sahih al-Bukhari. Let's get on to the fitna that Imam al-Bukhari faced. Imam al-Bukhari faced two major fitnas in his life. Number one was the fitna of jealousy. As I mentioned to you previously, jealousy is more rampant in the hearts of the scholars and the, sco uh, and the students of knowledge than in any other category of people. And the scholars recognize this so much 
that in the science of al jarh wa ta'dil, which is you know criticism of narrators, they established a principle: jarh al aqran yutwa wa la yurwa. That a criticism of one contemporary for another is completely ignored and is not narrated. Because if one contemporary is narrating another, it's automatically assumed that there's a malicious intent behind it. That he's unable to be you know, impartial, that he's unable to be unbiased. So they said if one contemporary you know, criticizes another, that the, you know, the, the disparagement is not accepted, but we reject it. So the criticism has to become from someone older, or from someone after that you know, came after. And that is when the disparagement will be accepted. Right? So, what ends up happening is when Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari is in the land of Naysapur. He's a great scholar of hadith by the name of Yahya ibn Yahya al-Zuhali. Great scholar of hadith. All of the scholars are gathering around Yahya ibn Yahya al-Zuhali. Everyone wants the Asanid from Yahya ibn Yahya al-Zuhali. Here comes Imam al-Bukhari. And Imam al-Bukhari, you know, for lack of better terms, blows Yahya ibn Yahya al-Zuhali's socks off. Yahya ibn Yahya is like, where did this guy come from? You know, all my students are trash. This is the guy that I want to teach. This is the guy that's going to continue my legacy and is going to continue my isnad. He starts teaching Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. What we don't realize, who is from the main students of Yahya ibn Yahya al-Zuhali? His own son, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhali. Now you can imagine, not only does you know, Imam al-Bukhari come and show you off, showing you how terrible of a student of knowledge you are compared to him, but your father actually loves him more than he loves you. You know, this is like the making of like a good Indian movie right now, right? <laughs> it shows you that you know, this, he, this man loves Imam al-Bukhari more than he loves his own son. What happens to Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhali? While he's a great Imam of Hadith himself, you know, thiqatun abid, he fell into a simple humanistic mis human mistake. Jealousy got the best of him. And at that time, you know, you can't say that, oh, you know, Imam al-Bukhari is a liar. You can't say that Imam al-Bukhari commits sins. You can't say that Imam al-Bukhari, you know, did this and that. Because Imam al-Bukhari's integrity and reputation precedes him. So how do you, you know, disparage Imam al-Bukhari? How do you get the people to abandon Imam al-Bukhari? The way you do it is by start telling the people that Imam al-Bukhari is an innovator. He is a heretic. He holds an aqidah different to the aqidah of the Muslims. Now what was the major issue of that time? The major issue of that time that was just finishing was the fitna of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, right? Which was the khalq of the Qur'an. Is the Qur'an created? Imam Ahmad, he stood up for the position of Ahlul Sunnah. The Qur'an is the speech of Allah and it is not created. And that is the nature of fitna that it continues and we use it to test people by. So people started coming. Muhammad ibn Yahya, he sent people, literally paid them and said, go and ask Imam al-Bukhari is the Qur'an created? Obviously he knew that Imam al-Bukhari would say no. Then he says, if Imam, when Imam al-Bukhari says no, ask him, how about our recitation of the Qur'an? How about our recitation of the Qur'an? Is that created? Now this is where a difference of opinion amongst the scholars actually took place. Should have Imam al-Bukhari stayed silent and made tawakkuf like his predecessors Imam Ahmad and you know, uh, Yahya ibn Mu'ayn and Ali ibn Madini did? Or should he actually gone on to explain? Where he says that the voice is created, but that which is recited is not created, right? And this is what his book that we didn't talk about, Khalq of Alul Ibad, is dedicated to. It is Khalq of Alul Ibad is the creation of the actions of the, of the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That all the actions that we do, they are created. It's dedicated to talking about this point, is the recitation of the Quran created. And our voice, as we understand it, that is created. But what is actually recited, that is not created. So Imam al-Bukhari, he introduced a statement which was true, but he was one of the first people to do it. And that's why people couldn't comprehend it. He's saying something true, but people couldn't comprehend it. He's like, well, they're like, why are you introducing something your predecessors didn't introduce? When he said this, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhali had a field day. He's like, I was looking for something. Imam al-Bukhari made it so easy. He's doing something that his predecessors made tawakkuf of. They stopped at. He started something new. So now that he finds this out, hey, Munib, did you hear what Imam al-Bukhari said? He said that the Quran, he said that the, the, the recitation of the Quran is created without giving any tafsil. Right? That's what he starts writing, that the recitation of the Qur'an is created. When Imam al-Bukhari made tafsil. Now when you understand this statement, that the recitation of the Qur'an is created, you can interpret it in two ways, that either the Qur'an is created or the voice is interpreted, or, or the voice is created. Now, Muhammad ibn Yahya, with his own agenda, he's pushing that Imam al-Bukhari is saying that the Qur'an is created. 
And anyone that said that the Qur'an was created was considered an innovator, was considered a heretic. Now when you live amongst a group of Ahl sunnah that everyone around you is Ahl sunnah and you hold a deviant belief, you will be abandoned. You will be completely abandoned. And that is what happened to Imam al-Bukhari. The whole Ummah abandoned him with the exception of two people. With the exception of two people. Imam Muslim and Muhammad ibn Salama. These are the only two people that stuck by Imam al-Bukhari. They, they stuck by Imam al-Bukhari. Everyone else abandoned him. Now you can imagine going from the most popular person to wherever you are, having thousands upon thousands of students, you know, teaching. That's what you, you loved to do most. You, you love to teach the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. But wherever you go, no one wants to learn from you because they now believe that you are a heretic. And this is the crazy thing, subhanAllah, that once a rumor is spread, there's nothing that you can do to 100% completely reverse people's perception. Even the likes of Imam al-Bukhari, he wasn't able to do that. And you know, subhanAllah, there's a famous quote by Mark Twain. He says, a lie will travel around the world before the truth even has an opportunity to put its shoes on. A lie will travel around the world before the truth even has an opportunity to put its shoes on. And that's what happened with Imam al-Bukhari. As soon as this statement came out, forget all the khidmah he did for the sunnah, forget about all of his righteousness, forget about every great thing that he did, everyone is focused on Imam al-Bukhari said that the Qur'an is created, which in fact was a lie and false within of itself. Now when we get to his death, we'll see you know, how people learned their lesson at the end, subhanAllah. So this is fitna number one. Now Imam al-Bukhari is humiliated and disgraced and kicked out of Naysapur. So what does he decide to do? Let me go back to my hometown of Al-Bukhara. Who is the Amir of Bukhara at that time? Khalid ibn Ahmad al-Zuhli. Okay, one of the narrator, one of the, you know, uh, Aqarib, one of the relatives of the, the Zuhli tribe. Khalid ibn Ahmad, he sees that Imam al-Bukhari is trying to teach hadith in the masjid and no one's attending. So he sends a letter to Imam al-Bukhari. He says, Ya Imam, I want you to come and teach my children in the house. You know, I don't want to send them to the masjid. I want you to come and teach them in my house. And this shows you the, you know, the Izza of Imam al-Bukhari and his, mashallah, his, his dedication to ilm. Imam al-Bukhari writes back to this Amir. He says, knowledge does not humble itself to anyone, but rather people humble themselves to knowledge. If you want your children to learn, send them to me. I'm not coming to your house. Now this is based upon two things, number one, uh, to understand. Number one, is that Imam al-Bukhari is teaching us about knowledge. That knowledge, it needs to be sought. It doesn't come to you. You can't expect knowledge to come into your own house. I and mean, they, they had no idea at that time that one day we'd be sitting in front of the computer and become ulama by watching YouTube, right? That was like unfathomed at that time. It couldn't be understood. But that was important to understand that people used to go out to seek knowledge. Knowledge wouldn't come to them. Number two, is that Imam al-Bukhari to protect his integrity, he kept away from all the rulers. Because it was understood that if you kept close to the rulers, your integrity would be compromised by either accepting their money or by giving fatawa that were in their favor, and so on and so forth. So he kept his distance at all times. What does the ruler of Bukhara do? He says, you know what? I'm kicking you out of Bukhara. So Imam al-Bukhari has been kicked out of Naysapur. He's been kicked out of Bukhara as well. Where does he go? He gets a letter from some of his relatives in Samarqand. And there's a small called Khartanak, that's where they live. So Imam al-Bukhari decides, you know what, let me just go stay with them. They're simple people, they have no knowledge of hadith. They don't know anything about this fitna. Inshallah, you know, I'll, I'll live a happy, you know, end to my life with them. He gets to them and it's just the end of Sha'ban. It's just the end of Sha'ban. Literally the last day or the second to last day of Sha'ban. Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, who's still with Imam al-Bukhari, he says that on the very first night of Ramadan, after he finished praying Qiyamul Layl, or at the end of his Qiyamul Layl, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Allahumma qad daqat alayya al-ardu bima rahubat faqbidni ilayk. That, oh Allah, as vast as this earth is, it's become extremely tight and congested for me. So take me back to you. Take me back to you. Now I want you to understand the pain in this dua, subhanAllah. He says, as vast as this earth is, it's become congested for me, so take me back to you. Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, he says, that not did the month of Ramadan end, except that Imam al-Bukhari died after Maghrib on the last day of Ramadan. On the last day of Ramadan, he completed the month of Ramadan, the month of fasting, the month of Quran, the month of Ibadah, the whole month. And on the night of Eid, 
That is when Imam al-Bukhari passed away. And they prayed his janazah at Dhuhr time on the day of Eid, subhanAllah. They prayed his janazah at Dhuhr time on the day of Eid. Now, once Imam al-Bukhari passes away, you know how you, they have that saying that you only realize what you've lost when you lose it? Like you only cherish the things that you've lost once they're gone? People realize the grave mistake they made with Imam al-Bukhari. And they literally used to go to his grave and seek forgiveness for, from him. And they say that there was such a strong fragrance that used to come from his grave that even the he passed away from the favors and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah showed to his awliya. And you know, Imam al-Dhabi narrates that even 400 years later after his death, that fragrance still used to come out subhanAllah. And that is you know, the, the life of Imam al-Bukhari. And this teaches us that you know, the trials that people go through in life, you think you have it rough. I mean, look at this man. This man was deprived of his one love in this life of teaching hadith because of a mistake that he didn't make that he was falsely accused of. But at the same time, I want you to look at and understand to people who know in this day and age who Muhammad ibn Yahya al is, until you study this life of Imam al-Bukhari, you will have no idea who Muhammad ibn Yahya al is. Even though he's a great alim, great scholar of hadith, you will never hear his name. Yet the name of Imam al-Bukhari, even though it was tarnished during that time, there's not a single Muslim household except that it has you know, Sahih al-Bukhari in it. And there's not a single khatib except that he will narrate his hadith. Not a single speaker except that he will mention him, right? This is the legacy of Imam al-Bukhari. These are the, 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 the ramifications and the fruits of sincerity and hard work. Now just to show you the insaf of Imam al-Bukhari, when we come to study the life of Imam Muslim, once he found out that Muhammad ibn Yahya, he's the one that spread the lies, Imam Muslim took all of the hadith, there were nine volumes that he narrated from Muhammad ibn Yahya al he sent them, he put them on a camel, and literally he told him, I'm not in need of your trash, take it back, I don't want it. Sent the camel with these books, no persons, just had it delivered off. Imam al-Bukhari from his insaf, is that there was a hadith that he has in Sahih al-Bukhari, that he could not find except through Muhammad ibn Yahya al Now you can imagine, if this one man ruined your life, would you bother narrating this hadith from him? It's like, what's the big deal if I skip just one hadith because of this treacherous man and how he's ruined my life? Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, rather than you know, doing that and just skipping one hadith, he actually changed his name. So you'll find a hadith, it says Abu Abdullah. That's all it says. The most generic kunya you can think of. Ibn Hajar, he mentions this Abu Abdullah is Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. That Imam al-Bukhari, he wanted to be genuine to hadith. And he didn't want to lose that. But at the same time, that, that hatred, not even hatred, that resentment towards the person that harmed you is there. So he skipped out his, his name and just put Abu Abdullah. And subhanAllah, you know, there's so many stories that I could mention, but we've, it's already past the time for Aisha. I, I don't want to delay it any further. But inshallah, I hope this gives you guys a glimpse of, you know, the many amazing biographies that are yet to come from the Imams of Hadith. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the ummah again with a love for hadith and brings about many, many great scholars from the science of hadith. Honestly, they're dying down. I'm telling you, genuinely speaking, the scholars of hadith are dying. There are very, very few amongst us and this love of hadith needs to be re-inspired. So I'm hoping that inshallah through studying their biographies, we will be inspired to study hadith and Allah will revive the scholars of hadith once again. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us for our shortcomings as well. Allahumma ameen. What we'll do is, we'll take the question and answers after Salat al-Isha inshallah. جزاكم الله خيرا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك